If you will, you turn with me to Romans, or in Romans, Revelation. Romans, as difficult as a book as it is, would be a lot easier than what we're doing right now. Revelation. Revelation chapter 11. And we are going to be looking at verses 1 through 13. Revelation 11, 1 through 13. Relatively easy to find. Last book in the Bible. And this is the word of God. John writes, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. And at that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. And this is the word of God to us, his people. Now, my recollection, it seems to me that when I was younger, the ministers that would become uh, popular, that nowadays we might call them celebrity preachers, um, those who most everybody knew their name, um, they got to that point because they were the perhaps the funniest of the ministers out there, perhaps because they were the ones that were most endearing to the world at large. Today, however, it seems a little bit different. It seems that the way one becomes a quote-unquote celebrity preacher is by being the angriest minister out there, perhaps by being the one who is most confrontational with the world at large. At least that's what it seems like in Reformed circles. And of course, their, their frustration and their, their anger is understandable to some degree as our culture, our culture has always stood opposed to the things of God and the things of his kingdom. But now it seems more and more that it's becoming more and more visible how strongly they stand against the ways of God. And there's this desire that our, our culture would turn back to the old paths in which the kingdom of the earth at least seemed to bear some resemblance to the kingdom of heaven. And so they, so we, we kind of get it. We get, we get where the frustration comes from. But, you know, we need to be discerning. We need to be discerning regarding who it is that we give ear to. We need to be discerning over who it is we platform for there are many out there who may be oppressed imp impressive uh, to, by the world's standards, but there are precious few who we would be able to say when we hear them that, that they give an answer for the hope that they hold with gentleness and respect as we are clearly and directly called to do in 1 Peter 
There is precious few that I hear nowadays that, that I would guess had ever read 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 through 4, which tells us, quote, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we might lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. When I hear a lot of these ministers who are the most popular, getting the, the most number of hits on YouTube, I wonder, have they ever read these verses? I can't tell by the way in which they carry on. I feel oftentimes when I, when I walk away from, from watching one of their videos that, that they would be completely unimpressed with the Apostle Paul. Since he tells us in 1 Corinthians 2 verses 1 through 5, he says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Sometimes I wonder if the people that I see that are platformed might not have even been impressed with Jesus himself, who said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Were my kingdom of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Now, when I read Revelation chapter 11, there's some things about this passage that stand out. It's, it's many things. Not the least of these is that it is the most difficult passage in Revelation that we've come to yet. To try to wrap our brains around and to understand. But as we do, what we find in this text is that it is a parable of sorts. And, and then while it is a prophecy of what is yet to come, it is just as much as a call to the church. And it is a call to the church to think more carefully about the way in which we engage a hostile world. And what type of engagement that the Lord will use to bring about the advent of his kingdom, to accomplish his kingdom purposes. So where we are thus far in the narrative is that we have seen a series of seal judgments and trumpet judgments that have been unleashed upon the world. And that is the world that stands in opposition to God and his people. And yet, the, despite the fact that these judgments are hard and they are uh, devastating, and they serve as not just a judgment, but a call to the people to come to the Lord in repentance, we are told in chapter 9, verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues did not Repent. So the judgments did not bring about the repentance of mankind before a holy God. But God has a plan. He has a plan to lead those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life to repentance. And that plan had yet to be revealed. Now, the plan does date back quite a while, of course. From all eternity, in fact, but we, we get a taste of it or, or an inclination of it back in Daniel chapter 12, in which Daniel, and I, I pointed us to this last week, where Daniel overhears some angelic beings discussing the time of the end. And Daniel can't make heads or tails of what it is they're talking about. And he asks them, what shall be the outcome of these things? And one of the angels responds to Daniel, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. And that's verse 9 of Daniel 12. 
Well, we have been watching as we've walked through the book of Revelation as Jesus has slowly unsealed the seals that have held tight and closed this plan of the end. The seal that has the answer to Daniel's question. And where we are in the story is now the final seal has finally been broken. And that seal, that scroll that contains God's plan has been handed to John and John is told to eat it. And that is a way of saying to John, internalize this message that you may then go out and proclaim it to the church. And John responds by saying, the scroll when I ate it was sweet to the taste, but it made my stomach bitter. In other words... It's sweet to the taste because that is what God's word is. God's word is sweet to the people of God. But sometimes, as we pointed out last week, the plan that God's word puts before us is not always the most pleasant of plans for the people of God in terms of our flesh. Sometimes the road is a very difficult road that we are called to walk on. Sometimes the, the path we are called to walk on is a path of suffering. Well, here in chapter 11, we begin to see what it is that made John's stomach bitter. I want to receive this, this sweet word of God. What is it that, that upset John about what God's plans contained. Chapter 10 ended with the call to John, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. And so he's saying the scroll contains within it the plan for the world, for the end of the world. We have come to the time of the end. Here's the plan. And this is what we read. So chapter 11. Verses 1 and 2, I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations. All right, what's, what's going on here? Well, measuring is a metaphor for God issuing a decree of protection for his people. And we see this time and again in the Old Testament. We will also see it when we come to Revelation 21, where the new Jerusalem is being measured, representing the fact that the inhabitants of new Jerusalem are protected from anything unclean. That those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life are the only ones allowed in. And that, that is, that's demonstrated or illustrated by the fact that the city is measured. An Old Testament um, passage that, that's related to the two, we find in Micah, where God is talking to the people of Israel who had been idolatrous and who had turned their backs on God. And he says to them concerning the coming judgment that they were going to face, you will have no one casting a measuring line for you. In other words, judgment's coming and it's going to hit you. Because you have not been measured off as those who will be protected. Now the background here in Revelation chapter 11 is the temple prophecy in Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48. In which we find a measuring of that temple. A measuring that secured the temple off from the abomination, the contamination of the way in which Israel's worship had just gone off the deep ends. And the declaration comes at the, at the end of the description. And I mentioned this in Sunday school. The very, the very end of Ezekiel, after the, the, the temple has been measured and described, the declaration comes. The Lord is there. And that gives us a clue as to what the temple is. The temple is the place where God dwells among his people. And the temple is first and foremost fulfilled in Christ himself, the word of God, who John 1, 14, tabernacled among us or templed among us, meaning he was the presence of God among his people. He is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus Christ is the temple of God. 
but it's by virtue of our relationship to him then that we as his people are now the temple of God. And we have seen that over and over again, especially when we walk through first Peter, we, we hammer down on that, that as the people of God, we are a priesthood of believers. And as the people of God, we are the place where the Holy spirit dwells. We are in fact, the temple of God. So the temple of God is God's people forming a spiritual temple where God's presence dwell. And we know that when, when we think about the, the Old Testament temple, we know how all the elements of it pointed to Christ and found its fulfillment in Christ. So we've said before again that the, the temple was a shadow. The reality was Christ. And so again, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 through 17. Now, because of our relationship with Christ, do you not know that you are God's temple? 2 Corinthians 6, 16. We are the temple of God. Ephesians 2, 21 through 22. We are joined together in a holy temple in, a, in the Lord. In him, you are being built together into a dwelling place for God in the spirit. 1 Peter 2, 5, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices. We know that when we get to Revelation 21, we've already pointed out that John, when he's describing the, the new Jerusalem, the new, the new heavens, he said there is no temple there because Christ himself is the temple. But again... It's by our relationship with him that we are the temple of God as well. And this is not a matter of spiritualizing the text. We allow the text to interpret the text. This is what the scripture says. And so while we read Ezekiel, we recognize that the prophecy's full, true fulfillment is in Christ and in his church. And so here, the measuring in Revelation 11 connotes God's presence, which is guaranteed to be among God's people. He is present among his people. It is, he's measuring out the temple to say, you are under my watch care and my Protection. You need not fear the evil to come. But we notice there in verse 2 that there's a call to not to measure the court as it will be given over to the nations. And we will see what that means in the verses that follow. The trampling of the court will mean the persecution and death of the two witnesses who will ultimately be vindicated as they are called up to be with the Lord. So in other words, we, we think about this court, we're not to think of it in negative terms. It's a part of the temple complex. It's, it's either the court that was just outside of the temple building that contained the altar of burnt offerings, which is indicated perhaps by, by the fact that it says to measure the altar there in verse 1. Or it could be, and, it, and this seems more likely to me, is that this is what the, the area of the temple complex that came to be known as the court of the Gentiles. This was a space designed for God-fearing Gentiles to come to the temple and to worship God. And we, we know, all of us kind of know, you may not have ever heard that, that description or that name before, but we're all kind of familiar with this idea of the court of the Gentiles or that there is one, because that's the place where Jesus went and overturned the tables. And when he went in and saw the, the, the money changers, and Jesus got so angry over that, and we may wonder, well, what was Jesus so angry about there? Well, it was because the money changers had come and set up their wares and were conducting business in the court of the Gentiles, which was designed for the Gentiles to come and pray unto the Lord. Jesus says, that, my father said, this will be the house of prayer. And this is where, where they are supposed to come pray unto the father and you're crowding them out. 
should never be. This is a house of worship. So the distinction that's taking place here now in these first two verses is that there's a, there's a measuring of the temple. There's a measuring of the people of God. But there's a plan that God is going to enact where, where there is going to be hostility, hostility allowed to come against his people. We are safe and secure in him. There is nothing that will threaten our spiritual well-being. We can rest in the knowledge of our eternal inheritance in heaven. The gates of hell will not prevail. But God is going to give permission to the world to attack his witnessing church. But it cannot touch the true spiritual health of his people. And so we read, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Why 42 months? Well, first understand that just doing simple math, 42 months is the equivalent of 1,260 days, which is the equivalent of three and a half years, which is also described in Revelation as time plus times plus half a time. All of these expressions mean the same thing. The same length of time. So why this amount of time? Why, why 42 months? Well, just like many of the details we find in Revelation, there's multiple layers to the answer to that question. One of those, I mean, when Israel was wandering through the wilderness, if you, if you read through their wilderness wanderings, you will find that the story is told as a series of 42 encampments. 42 months was the length of time that Elijah kept rain from falling from the skies, a sign of God's judgment against King Ahab. And in that time, the, it was a sign of judgment against him, but that, that, that drought that came about upon the land was a time of suffering for all the people in the land. 42 months was the length of time the Antiochus Epiphanes profaned the sanctuary as described in the book of Daniel. And so 42 months actually became a metaphor that was used commonly in Jewish teaching to describe a time of trial and tribulation in which God allowed evil to seem to reign. And it could be the same time that Jesus refers to as the time of the Gentiles that he describes in Luke 21, 24. And one thing that's really interesting also is that Jesus's earthly ministry was about 42 months, three and a half years. And we are told that during that time that he was one who was despised, rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And so we, we can take any of these tracks or we could just layer them right on top of one another. And we come up with this idea that 42 months or 1260 days or a time and times and half a time is a rich metaphor of a time of trial and of suffering, a time of wilderness wandering, a time even when the people of God will be called to follow the steps of our Savior, who was a suffering Savior, one who suffered for our sake. And that's so that's what we see then in verse three. I will grant authority to my witnesses. They will prophesy for 1260, 1260 days clothed with sackcloth. And so here we have these two witnesses who are prophesying for these 42 months. 1260 days wearing sackcloth, which is a sign of lamentation and mourning. Now, who are these two witnesses? I think we can be assured that these are not simply two individual prophets, but these stand for the community of God's people. 
That's part of the, the imagery that we're given here. A community of God's people who are to be prophetic witnesses to the world like the great prophets of the Old Testament. They are like Elijah who, in verse 6 we have here, shut the skies so that no rain may fall. They are like Moses who had power over waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every type of plague. But just like how John the Baptist was not literally Elijah, but came in the spirit and power of Elijah, so the witnesses are not Moses and Elijah reincarnated. And we can tell that just right away by reading the story. You've got this description of both of them having the exact same powers. It's not that one of them was able to call down rain and one of them was able to bring about plagues. It's both of them were able to do both things. Why? Because they represent the people of God. And we know this is the case because we're directly told that this is the case in verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So let's go ahead and take the lampstands first. When we're trying to understand what are the different images that we are given, what are the metaphors, the signs that are, that are brought forward in Revelation, we're trying to grapple with them, what does this mean? Well, again, we let Scripture interpret Scripture, and we're going to first start and say, well, where else in the book of Revelation has John used this image? And so when we come to the lampstands, we immediately are put back into chapter 1, you recall. And what did the lampstand stand for? The church. There were seven lampstands, which were the seven churches. And so we have here the lampstands giving light as it's given to them by the Holy Spirit to, to bear light into the darkness. And of course, that, that image, as we saw, we were in first Peter, or first, uh, Revelation 1, first came to us from the prophet Zechariah. And we find in Zechariah 4 that that's where the two olive trees come from as well. And we find in Zechariah 4 where God is providing His Spirit so the metaphor for a spirit here is, is the oil. And he provides a spirit through oil trees, olive trees, which are Joshua, high, the high priest, and King Zerubbabel. And what are they doing? Where they're being equipped by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, given strength by the Holy Spirit in order to rebuild the temple in the face of hostile powers. And so when we come to Revelation, and we're told, these two are the two lamps, and these are the two olive trees, what we are being given is a picture here of the people of God, anointed by and empowered by the Holy Spirit, being a prophetic witness, shedding light out into the darkness, so that the people of God might increase in number in the face of the world's hostile attacks. In fact, we are told here in verse 7 that the beast will make war with them, which is an echo of Daniel 7, 21, which says the beast will make war with the saints. And we're going to find this again in Revelation 13. The beast makes war for how long? For 42 months. Against two, Against the saints. And that's who these two witnesses represent. And this is how, by the way, when we get to verses 9 through 13, it tells us that the, the world looked upon them. The world rejoiced over this, this death. Well, well, how is it that the entire world could see them if they're just two individuals in a single city? Well, the reason the whole world can rejoice is because... This is the people of God around the world. These two lampstands are in every country around the globe. And they will find pers face persecution. They will have the handy, heavy hand of, the, uh, of their oppressors down upon them. And those people will rejoice when they seem to be defeated 
So why, why is it just two witnesses? Why, why not say, well, then there was a multitude of witnesses that went forward. Well, well again, we, we let Scripture interpret Scripture, and we recognize that this is a vision given to John. It's, it's got all kinds of uh, symbols and, and meanings behind the images. So, so why two? Well, back in the Old Testament law, what's it tell us about two witnesses? We see it repeated in Numbers and Deuteronomy that it is by the witness of two witnesses that the truth shall be established. Jesus will repeat this himself in Matthew 18 and John 8. And it's used as a, as a way of saying that the testimony, the witness, the prophetic witness of the church is true. And what is true brings about lamentation and mourning. Again, by the witnesses indicated by their sackcloth. Now, we come to verse 5, and this is a really interesting statement that, that caused some head scratching because it says, If anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. Now, strange statement. And remember, again, we're talking about vision. We're talking about word pictures and and all of that, and so this likely harkens back to Elijah, who was able to call fire down from heaven to consume his enemies, 2 Kings chapter 1. I mean, we, we're not expecting fire to actually pour forth from these witnesses' mouth. And so we might think of them as this is, this is emblematic of the idea that they are lampstands. They are fed with oil by the Holy Spirit. And just as Jesus was said to have out of his mouth a two-edged sword by which he slayed his enemies, so these witnesses bring, breathe fire, words of rebuke, words of judgment that spells the doom of the wicked. It's, it's just like Jeremiah. Jeremiah uses this imagery. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14. He says to the Lord, Be because you have spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your in my mouth. I'm making my words, your words in my mouth, a fire. Sorry, let me start all over again. Because you have spoken this word, behold, I am making your words in my mouth a fire. And this people would, and the fire will consume them. Now, did Jeremiah actually breathe fire? No. But it's speaking in illustrative language of the judgmental word of God coming forth from his prophets. Verse 6. They have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Again, the shutting of the sky. This is referencing Elijah as we know that he prayed that it would not rain as a sign of God's judgment. And indeed it did not for 42 months. Uh, the waters being turned to blood is referencing Moses. And uh, as we might say, uh, we might, might say, what, what's going on here? I mean, the, this message of final judgment unleashes plagues upon those who are the unrepentant. Um, this was probably chosen. I mean, this, this is type of language. And, and, and Elijah and Moses themselves are probably chosen because they were seen as being the greatest of prophets, the greatest of prophets who stood up against a pagan power, who stood against and opposed to God's kingdom. And so you have Moses who confronted the Pharaoh and his magicians. You had Elijah who confronted Jezebel and the prophets of Baal. They were the ones, when you thought of prophets, who were the greatest of prophets who stood up against pagan powers. And so here we are called to stand in their shoes. Verse 7, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And so again, we've got the courts which are given over to be trampled on. In other words, this, this portion of believers that are being specifically referenced here, although this has application to believers in all times, 
but they will find themselves as being the targets of the beast who which will come to decimate the church and the church will appear to be defeated this is this is matthew 24 just go back to read what jesus said is going to happen at the end in matthew 24 here it is and this harkens back to Revelation chapter 6, which you remember. Here you've got the martyrs before the throne crying out to God. How long will it be before you're going to vindicate our blood against those who slaughtered us? And the answer comes back, not until the final number of martyrs is complete. There are those who have been set aside unto martyrdom. And after the last martyr is killed, then will come the end. And again, this, this language is coming directly to us from Daniel chapter 7. If we look at verse 21 in Daniel chapter 7, you've got the prophecy of the final kingdom on earth. And it'll, it's this battle is going to come against God's people. It'll appear to defeat God's people. But afterward, the persecutors will be persecuted and judged themselves. Well, the, the, the people of God will come back against them and defeat them. The saints in the end will be the ones who inherit the kingdom of the world. God says, God, we we're told, God gave judgment to the saints. And, and so here we have, in Revelation chapter 11, Daniel chapter 7, explained. This is what this meant so verse 8 their dead bodies will lie in a street of the great city that symbolically is called sodom and egypt where their lord was crucified now again the church is going to appear when the world comes against the church in this wave of persecution under the direction of the beast who we will learn about here in the weeks to come, the church will seem to be defeated. It will seem to be brought to its knees. It will have been brought to a point of being small and insignificant. It will be treated with indignity. We notice that in verse 9, that the the dead bodies that the people will refuse to allow them to be buried. And that's because that was a way of mocking. It was a way of saying that these that are dead are not deserving of any level of respect. But this last phrase there in verse 8 where it says... It talks about this city that's being referenced here where the Lord was crucified. It leads some people to assume that this is speaking of Jerusalem. I mean, that seems like, well, obviously it's talking about Jerusalem. But anytime, speaking of the great city, and again, we've got to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Anytime the phrase great city is used in Revelation, and it is used seven times in the book of Revelation, it's always referring to Babylon. And Babylon as a symbol of Rome, which in turn symbolizes the Antichrist's earthly opposition to God. And so when we read this, we're seeing that he's talking about, it's, it's referencing Sodom, is referencing the depths of moral degradation in the world. Egypt, the symbol of oppression and slavery in the world. The great city is a symbol of political power and self-deification. In the world as the emperors would set themselves up of, against God. And this is a world that crucified Christ. Verse 9. For three and a half days some of the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. Again, this is a worldwide event. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. The world will celebrate when the church is finally out of their way. And this sounds harsh, we see, but, but we see echoes of this today. I saw not too long ago on social media, it was in response to 
the church's opposition to uh, the move of transgenderism in our culture. Somebody had said something and somebody responded, I now understand why Christians were fed to the lions. And so, I mean, just, just a little taste of it, but th this is what the scriptures are telling. It's going to be like. There is not going to be any sense of remorse or guilt over the destruction of the church. They're going to rejoice over it because the church is seen as being an obstacle to their freedom. We are the stumbling block in their way. So there's going to be a great celebration when the church seems to have breathed its last breath. But the celebration will last, as we see here, for only three and a half days in contrast to the three and a half years of the church's witness in the face of this persecution. In other words, the apparent victory of Satan is going to be very brief. Verse 11, but after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet and the great fear fell on those who saw them. So God restores the witnesses unto himself after their apparent defeat at the end of the age. Now, this image of, of them being breathed on and, and coming back to life, I mean, it's taken right off the pages of Ezekiel chapter 37, where the people of Israel are shown to be bones. And the question comes, can these bones live? The Lord only you know, and then the spirit is breathed upon them. And they come to life. Now, because that imagery in Ezekiel was, was figurative of God's spiritual work in the people of Israel, some people argue that this here is actually a figurative way of talking about God's work among his people as well. Um, maybe the, the idea of them being able to stand up is just them being able to stand in the face of persecution. And then, you know, somebody... Perhaps is, is holding a gun to them, knowing that they know if, if I confess Christ, that that trigger is going to be pulled. And their willingness to do that and confess Christ in the face of death is a way of, of the resurrection life of the Spirit being present in them. And it becomes a, a declaration of all these things. But, but that all being said, verse 12 leads me to believe that it ought to be just read simply as what it says. Verse 12, then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies watched them. Now we read 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, that quote, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. That is the words of Paul. And I think here we find that prophecy fulfilled. Verse 13. At that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Now here again, we were taken back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapters 37 through 39, where God has saved his people. He set his sanctuary in their midst, he says. And then that is followed by a devastation of those who stood opposed to him. And a sign of their devastation was a great earthquake. That great earthquake indicated judgment has come. And what we're going to find throughout Revelation, that when we come to the time in the end, when, when time is up, we'll find this language of there was a great earthquake. Now, what makes this verse interesting is the fact that only a portion of the city has fallen while the rest give glory to the God who is in heaven. Now, we we know that this is describing the end of the world. We know that because of what comes next. The seventh trumpet is blown. That's what comes next. So th this is the end. This is how everything comes to its end. But we're looking at it here in chapter 11 from a wide angle lens. As, as we go in chapters 
uh, following, we're going to kind of zoom in and we're going to see things in more detail. We're going to see things uh, fleshed out a little bit better. But this is a wide angle lens. And so what does it mean? What is this telling us? What, is, what does this mean that the rest gave glory to the God of heaven? Well, anytime this language is used in the rest of uh, Revelation, in the word, it, it's talking about the, what is owed to God. It's, it's worship that's owed to God. It, it's in, indicative of somebody whose heart has been changed and they're, they're praising his name. So I think this is what's going on. We've got Jesus, who who was called the faithful witness because he bore witness to the truth of God's plan for his people, the gospel unto death, to the point of death, of course, including his death. Well, the way that the victory of the kingdom of God will take effect in bringing the nations to repentance and faith is by the followers of Christ participating in his victory. It is by them following him and maintaining their witness to the point of death. And then they are vindicated as true witnesses by God. And when the world sees this, Those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will come to believe. Here they watch and they see God's plan unfold. Now, they didn't have to wait until this end. They've seen the witness of the nations. They hear the witness of Christ's people as they faith face death and martyrdom around the world even today. But here we have in this story how witnesses will come to faith at the 11th hour, as it were. The dead rise first. The persecutors seeing their faith vindicated. Some of them come to faith and are caught up. It's just as 1 Thessalonians describes. Now, why these numbers? Why do we have the tenth of the city? Why do we have 7,000? Well, these numbers, again, and this is so, when we see numbers in Revelation, the first thought ought to be, okay, where else are these numbers in the book of the Bible? Because that's, that's what happens with these visions. There's always something that this is pointing back to. Indeed, again, they push us back to the Old Testament. Whenever God's judgment comes upon people, there is always this language of a remnant that will be spared. A small remnant that will be expected to survive when God's judgment comes against the majority. So this remnant is described as a tenth part of the people in Amos. Elijah was called to bring about judgment on everyone except the 7,000. Who were spared when they refused to bow the knee to Baal. So we got the same two numbers that speak of a remnant, but in Revelation, those numbers are reversed. And so we actually have a pretty optimistic view here at the end. What will be the result of the witness of God's people unto death? There will be a large number of people who will see and will be saved. And then the end will come. I believe this is the message of the scroll. It's the final period of world history. God will not deliver his faithful people from the slaughter of his enemies but he will allow them to be martyred. And in this way, he will use their following in the steps of their suffering Lord to bring the nations to repentance and faith. And the chapters to follow are going to flesh that out more. It's going to give us a 
a closer look into what all this means. So what does this mean to all of us? Why did I start off by talking about these angry talking heads that we see? Well, I think that there is a time for the church to spit fire for sure, to use the imagery out of here. We see it in the text. But the continual testimony that we have seen in Revelation is that judgment alone does not bring repentance. The judgment of God through the seals did not bring repentance. The judgment that came through the trumpets did not bring repentance. We're told that. What brings repentance? A declaration of judgment in tandem with the testimony of Christ by those who are willing to lay down their lives is the method that God uses to advance his kingdom. That is the way of Christ. And I think too few in the church recognize this. We have a lot of angry fire breathers out there. But as soon as you mention to them the concepts of humility, self-deprecation, kindness, love, patience, what follows? Accusations of compromise. Accusations of weakness. And I think this is a sickness in the reformed world today. There is a book that came out, and I don't want to sidetrack on this topic, but, there, but this is the, the book. There's a book that came out about Christian nationalism. And in it, the author calls men, Christian men, we are to be men of endurance. We are to be men of Power. We need to be, we need to resist the pressure to be men of low testosterone. I mean, that, that's what the book says. That's virtually a quote out of the book. Well, somebody quoted that on social media and a pastor that I know, a friend of mine, who has a physical disability that renders him unable to stand up when he preaches. He has to sit in and down in a chair in order to preach. He pushed back on that. He said, can, can we actually read what the scripture says about the way of Christ and what it is to be a man of Christ and what it is to, to bear witness on behalf of Christ? His call was simply, we need to be more scripturally informed than this. Well, somehow the author of this book, which is, I think, the top seller in this category right now, the author of this book saw my friend's tweet. And he responded this way. Quote, your reminder, meaning all you readers that saw this guy's, he, he quote tweeted it. So he quotes my friend, and then he says, this is your reminder that many pastors want men to be a mess, to make them easy to control, and offer them nothing to reform themselves. They will insist that you remain weak. That's evil. That's an attitude of pride. That's an attitude of arrogance. And it is everywhere right now. And the reformed world is falling in line and following this stuff. The way of Christ is the way of suffering. This does not mean that we do not call sin, sin. This does not mean that we don't you know, write letters to the governor. It doesn't mean that we don't make our voices heard. Absolutely we do this. But if our voices not only condemn the sin, but offer hope through Christ Jesus, if they don't also communicate love for enemy, if they don't also communicate a humility befitting the gospel of Christ, if we are not walking about in ourselves the aroma of the crucified Christ, shame on us. What are we doing? What is even motivating us? What is the, what's the end game that we're after here? Our end game is the gospel. Our end game is to glorify Christ. Christ. 
If our voices are accompanied by bravado, by chest thumping, by fingers in the face, rather than the cross upon our backs, then I don't think Jesus nor Paul would even recognize us as walking in their path. If we're, not, if we're not doing that, then we have a question. We have right to question. Now, I'm looking here right in chapter 11. I have a right to question. What role are we actually playing in God's plan about bringing about his kingdom? This is the path he calls his church to. May he give us the willingness and the strength to do it. Let's pray.